thanks, Declan. So let me just introduce the other panelists here today. I think we've got a nice mix of people from different perspectives, from uh, officialdom in both uh, Brussels or formally, and, uh, and and Dublin, academia, uh, business, north south. Um, we also had, we were supposed to have um, a kind of London perspective, Lisa Carroll from The Guardian, she sent her regrets, she had to pull out on Friday. So let me briefly just introduce Catherine Day, uh, until 2015 was the most senior civil servant in the European Commission in, in Brussels, uh, currently now a board member here uh, and still advises uh, young called uh, Juncker. Um, Connell uh, McDevitt uh, runs CEO, he runs Hume Brophy, the, the company, amongst other things, uh, advises uh, its clients on Brexit, uh, many different capacities, uh, and based in, in, in here, Belfast and, and Brussels. Uh, and David Finnemore, Professor David Finnemore, is, is a professor of politics at Queen's, uh, a UK national, uh, who specialises in European politics, so we've got, uh, as I say, hopefully a good uh, mix. This session and the other sessions, each of the panelists are going to just give a very brief introductory few mar remarks. We're going to make it as discursive as possible. Uh, lots of questions for, for, for anybody who wants to chip in. So if you have any thoughts or questions, just indicate uh, at any time that you have an interest in putting something, and uh, I'll come to you as soon as we can. Good, okay, so in alphabetical order, just with those opening remarks, can I hand over to Catherine to give her opening thoughts uh, on uh, negotiating Brexit? Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to make three quick points to throw out for a subsequent discussion, um, and they're in the form of, of uh, two questions and a comment. One is, when will the real negotiation start? Then to talk a little bit about the timing, and then to talk a little bit about the role of the UK media um, in all of this. Um, everybody said it's been a year, the negotiations started last week, but have they really started? We will see the uh, first British position paper later today. Um, people are on the EU side are itching to get started, have wanted to for a long time. The EU side is ready, has been ready for months. Um, but um, I don't feel that the UK system is ready to negotiate yet. The debate is still at the ideological level. The UK has a formidable civil service, and when it's given clear instructions uh, as to what it's supposed to achieve, it's second to none. But I don't feel that that level of focus on detail has yet been achieved. And I think what we are seeing to some extent in the political negotiating team is people who don't really understand how the EU works and are now just beginning to discover it very late in the day. Um, it's good that we start on citizens' rights. That's an important issue. Uh, the Commission has published its paper a little while ago. Uh, we get the UK paper today. I think um, some sort of grandfathering uh, is obviously the solution, but I think we will get stuck fairly quickly on uh, how to make sure that these rights continue into the future. And the question of whether there's a, a, an independent uh, legal body that oversees those rights, because if the rest of the EU is asked to accept that the British government into the future will guarantee those rights, then there would have to be pretty strong guarantees that they won't just be overturned by a new government down the road. And the second issue that they will come to on looking at the uh, financial liabilities of the UK as it leaves the EU will also be difficult. So um, we will get into, uh, I think, rather difficult negotiations fairly quickly. But nonetheless, um, my, my fundamental point remains, I don't think the British system has yet focused on the compromises that they will have to make because their negotiating position seems to be we, we want everything we like and we don't want anything we don't like. And you cannot send people into technical negotiations with that as a mandate. You have to decide this is more important than that. Um, it seems to me that the British really have to assess um, the value of negotiating their own trade deals versus the inconvenience, uh, to put it mildly, of leaving the customs union. And where do they put that on the scale of their priorities, of the things that they don't like about the EU? And I don't think they have begun to do more than scratch the surface of that yet. Secondly, on timing, um, it was always going to be tight. Uh, not because two years isn't long enough to negotiate a divorce uh, arrangement or the, th the way in which the UK will leave, but because it's difficult to conclude on the divorce settlement until you see where you're going next. And that includes going through the transitional arrangements. And we will get some clarity from the Article 50 negotiations. If the UK continues to say we will leave the customs union, then we will know we're into a different scenario. 
if they say, well, after all, having looked at it and now seeing what we see, we will stay in the customs union, then I think that will resolve a lot of issues and make the subsequent arrangements and the negotiation of transitional arrangements much easier. But still, all of that will take a lot of time. Um, it's tempting uh, to say that um, the time period of two years provided under Article 50 will be extended. It can be, if it's provided in the article itself, that if everybody agrees, the time period can be extended. And given the difficulty of making predictions at the moment and seeing how the world changes from one hour to the next, um, I would think uh, a possible extension of the time period could be a good way to smooth the transition from one uh, regime to another. But as always, as, as has been for a long time, it will depend on the politics of the Tory party and not anything else uh, when the moment of taking that decision comes. Um, Without wanting to sound like Andrea Leadsom over the weekend, I do want to say something about um, the role of the British media in all of this. Um, because for a long time, they have taken a very confrontational approach to Europe and have always seen it as win and lose, So, uh, which is not the way most of the rest of the EU looks at negotiations. It's about coming to an agreement that everybody can be more or less happy with. And you saw that right at the beginning. The UK was considered to have conceded and caved in by accepting the sequencing um, that the, the EU had already decided um, in April. Now, I think um, that is not a good sign of things to come because these negotiations will be very detailed. They will go on in very different sectors. Things will be negotiated to a certain level and then parked and compromises will be made across the whole range of things. So if you have a simplistic mentality that says, every negotiating session Britain has to win, otherwise it's losing. It's going to make the mood music uh, and the actual handling of the negotiations much more difficult, I think. Um, and by the way, I think um, the UK is going to have to get used to accepting that the bigger partners with whom it will be negotiating in the future will cause, call most of the shots. That will apply in the trade deals that they're hoping to do, as well as in their dealings with the EU. So um, it seems to me that, yes, we have we have finally have started. Um, there is a lot of exasperation, frustration, I think, around the EU27, and certainly here, that people still don't know um, what it's going to be like one year after the vote is taken. I think it will take quite a bit longer before we actually can get clear answers to the questions that people are asking, because we have to go through some of the issues like the citizens' rights and the financial liabilities before we get to discuss the trade details, which is what I think most of Ireland wants clear answers on. So it's going to be a long haul exercise. I think the politics has changed in the last few weeks. It could change again in this long haul exercise. It could change several times in this long haul exercise. So we just have to um, have the patience to stick with it and go through it. And I'll stop there because I think there'll be plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, and over to you, Connell. Thanks. Um, morning, everyone. Maybe to pick up on, on Catherine's point about the Conservative Party, I guess. This starts in the British Conservative Party and it will end in the British Conservative Party. We're only here because of its dysfunctional relationship with Europe going back since forever. And uh, it, is, it is the ultimate case study in the tiny tail wagging a huge mammoth dog of the European Union. So the first question I'd like to pose is this. Can this British Conservative Party deliver a settlement? And the answer to that is clearly no. You know, you may run a government on a confidence and supply agreement. Absolutely, there are plenty of really great examples in this jurisdiction in Scotland and elsewhere around the world of minority governments running to an agreed program for government on domestic agenda and doing so quite well. But can you negotiate the exit of a member state of the European Union, a confidence and supply agreement with the DUP? You cannot. And I think that's the first reality check we all need to accept. It just cannot happen. It is just too complicated. Uh, and if it can happen, then we will be really, really, really fundamentally rewriting the books. Of, uh, of democracy and the way governance has operated uh, over the past uh, past 50 odd years here in here in Europe and elsewhere in uh, sort of what's known as the uh, the democratic world. I think the second point I'd like to make is 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 related, which is when you come to negotiations. Uh, Seamus Mallon told me when I was a very young man, you need to ask two basic questions. The first is you need to ask yourself whether the individuals on the other side of the table are willing to do a deal. So is there a willingness to actually achieve an outcome? And that, I think, talks very directly to Catherine's point 
about the fact that an outcome by definition will be a consensus. It will be a win-win or a lose-lose. It can't be a win-lose. So is there a willingness? Uh, I sense a reluctant willingness on behalf of the remaining members of the European Union. It's a reluctant one. They do not want to be in this situation. I'm not certain there is a willingness uh, in the United Kingdom because if there were a willingness, the no-deal option would be off the table. Let's think about it. Just step back from a second. You would not be saying no deal is an option if there was actually a fundamental willingness to reach an agreement. And the second criteria that James used to always talk to was the ability to do so, at which point I used to get asked to leave the room. <laughs> and that is, you know, is the capacity there within the system on the other side of the table to actually do the heavy lifting that will be needed in order to reach an agreement? And there's several types of, of individuals, several types of skill sets that you need on the other side of the table in order to reach the agreement. You need excellent technocrats, and Whitehall is brimming with excellent technocrats. It's brimming with individuals who have led the way in shaping uh, structures of permanent government of, of accountable civil service. And they, if left to do their job, will do a fantastic job. Uh, but you also need the big thinkers. You need people who have a vision beyond the settlement. They need to be able to, be able to actually clearly uh, explain and clearly advocate and convince all those technocrats of the merits of what they are doing all this work for. In other words, that what will happen after the settlement will be better than what we have today. And the third thing is you need the critic in the room. You need the, you need the contrarian, the skeptic, the one that says, oh yeah, but what about? And I think at best in the UK today, you have two out of those three. You might have the contrarian and you certainly have the technocrat, but you do not have the big thinker. So that's the second hurdle uh, that I think uh, we have to consider. And all of this, I think, is important in the context of Brexit uh, because we know Brexit is about process. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a lovely poster on the wall and study in the house. I was meant to try and get my kids who are all sort of in their secondary school years now to try and embrace the process. And it says, embrace the process. I turn up every day and do your homework. It'll come good in the end. Uh, Europe is very good at embracing the process. Here in Ireland, uh, in our relationship in Europe, we have always embraced the process. That's why we got such a good outcome from Article 50. That's why the directives are disproportionately advantageous to us as a very small uh, member state. Uh, the United Kingdom learned a lot about embracing the process through the peace process. They came to the peace process as bilateralists. They did not particularly understand, in my opinion, how to leverage process to achieve an outcome. But is that learning still there and will they apply it to these negotiations? To finals, Catherine Point. I'm just not sure. Uh, I have the benefit of, of, of the privilege of running a company that has people who sit in London, 25 of them, people sit here, people sit in Brussels, people sit in Frankfurt, in Paris, in Berlin, and out in Asia. And you know, when they come back having spoken to ministers, here's a great anecdote. This is what they come back to you with when they spoke to ministers. And the Sunday after the general election, before, uh, the day after, uh, Downing Street had put out the statement saying there was a deal with the DUP and then the DUP had put out a statement saying there was no deal with the British government. Uh, two of my senior colleagues, both of whom were active, active in, uh, in the Conservative Party and very well connected, came back to report a conversation with two different members of the British government in which those individuals expressed total confidence that the DUP would be over the line by, by basically lunchtime on Monday and that there was nothing really to worry about. And that just doesn't display uh, you know, a, a very worrying ignorance of northern politics uh, and the dynamics of northern politics and the fact that every political party and everyone who's been forged in northern politics comes to negotiations as a marathon and a, and a war of attrition and it's a simple rule, it's the rule of last person standing and you give nothing until you've got everything. Uh, but it also displays a fundamental ignorance of process, of basic process in that you don't enter any negotiations in a predeterminist mindset. You do, do not brief during negotiations that things are over when there's still stuff on the table because the reaction that that generates is only ever one, and that is for more stuff to be put on the table and for the negotiations to drag out. And I guess uh, I feel about Brexit uh, uh, um, three things. One is I feel a deep deep sense of uncertainty. And it's not uncertainty because of the consequences of withdrawal and 
what we do on a technocratical level after the point and how we reorder Europe around ourselves. It's uncertainty about the ability to even get there and how much damage could be done in the next two to three years as it unravels further, maybe to eventually reach a final destination, but definitely to unravel. And the second thing I feel is I feel quite depressed and down about how we ended up in a situation where a political party that represents a very noble and long-standing tradition in British politics, but in the grand scheme of Europe, uh, is not uh, uh, the determinant of our future, has been able to create a situation where we are who we are today. And, and thirdly, I fear for us here in Ireland, because it is well documented that we are the most impacted and exposed uh, peoples, uh, we have the most impacted and exposed economy, and we have uh, the most complicated set of outcomes to, to negotiate and to achieve with regard to maintaining the integrity of the island uh, and the integrity of the Good Friday institutions and the integrity of consent. It is, it is you know, I spent 20, 20 years, and I still live in Belfast, uh, passionately advocating the case for constitutional nationalism. It, it was never in the rule book or in the script book of constitutional nationalism that we would exploit a bad decision in Britain to accelerate uh, an exercise of consent on this island. And any exercise of consent that is brought about as a consequence of a crisis elsewhere may achieve something that would be very beautiful for many people on, on this island, me too, but it would not be the way to achieve it. So the stakes could not be higher. And, and to be honest with you, you know, the probability of it all falling apart before we get even to third base in one dimension or another, in my opinion, are exceptionally high. Good, thanks. Well, we'd certainly pick up on that and get everyone's views on that. Uh, David. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for the invitation to, to be here. Um, pick up on a couple of the issues which have been raised by both Catherine and Colonel. Um, on the first one, uh, capacity. Um, I think one of the things we really got to appreciate is the sheer scale of what is a multifaceted set of Brexit negotiations. Uh, we've heard about the Article 50 withdrawal negotiations. There's been an allusion to the trade dimension as well. I think we have to be aware there's the transitional dimension there and also the domestic questions about repatriation of power um, repeal the legislation plus the devolution dimension as well and all that's happening concurrently um, and then we've also got to think as part of that what the British government is trying to do in terms of delivering on the um, freedom to secure its own external trade agreements so all the work that's going on in the new replacement trade agreements with, with third countries um, and that's all compounded by the fact that you've got a shrinking civil service plus um, a very weak minority government continued uncertainty and that, to my mind, is before the realities of negotiation, negotiating with the EU hit home. So uh, <laughs> the complexity of this is, is, is amazing. Um, and there must be questions as to whether the resource exists um, to deliver on any one of those, let alone all of them. And I, and I, I don't think there's been sufficient appreciation in, in the British system um, of, the, of the scale of the task ahead. Um, the second point I want to make is about the EU position, um, which in many respects has been very impressive in terms of unity. Uh, I'm also struck by the fact that the Article 50 negotiation, the mandate, I think only had to be a qualified majority given the way the outcome is going to be a qualified majority. The stress has been on that being adopted at unanimity um, and in a very, very short period of time. Okay. That's important, um, I think, because it is going to be the EU position which determines the possible outcomes for the negotiations. And when we think about the EU position, we have to think not just about what's coming out of Brussels, but the fact that each of the member states operate under their own domestic constraints. We've got institutional preferences coming through from the Commission and from the Parliament as well, and we throw in, in the Council. And I think as part of these one aspect of the negotiations, which isn't necessarily appreciated, is the fact that whatever the EU does, um, or includes in, its, in the agreement with the UK, does set precedents. Precedents that it's, the EU is going to be very wary about setting, not just in terms of potential state leaving, but also in terms of say, um, trade agreements. The sort of concessions which may be made on agriculture are going to be poured over by a whole host of states outside the EU. And this is going to constrain the EU in what it's going to be willing to do. The type of institutional relationship the UK may set up, uh, the EU may set up with the UK, is going to be looked at by other states who are in a very, very close relationship with the EU. 
EU, but don't have access to institutions, don't have a decision-making making role. And I think that, that constraint I exists on, on the EU. So this is a shadow of relations with other states, which is going to influence the EU's position as well. Final point um, comes from just looking back at the history of EU external relations um, and what the EU has done over time. And I think we can identify a number of under, underlying principles which the EU has adhered to <coughs> consistently over time, and I don't think are going to be broken in this instance. Firstly, is that balance between rights and obligations. If you want to have any particular access to the EU, you want to have any sort of engagement, it comes with obligations. This goes back to the, the cherry picking, the sort of having a cake and eating it. But I sometimes think in the British discourse about Brexit and about the future relationship, this fundamental principle is not sufficiently understood, even though it's there in the treaty. The secondly, there is decision-making autonomy of the EU. Whatever relationship you're going to have with the EU in the future <coughs> is going to be one where you are outside the EU. You're outside of decision-making. At best, you're going to get decision-shaping. When we think about many of the obligations which the British may have to take on board, I wonder whether they're going to be able to accept that position, but that's going to be the position it has. And then the third principle which comes out, if we look back at the history of relations, is the prioritisation by the EU of the internal over the external. Ultimately, the EU's interests are its own, and its own integration process, and that's going to trump any desire to make any significant concessions to the British. So I'm not particularly optimistic when it comes to how these negotiations may actually um, proceed. Okay, thanks. good, thanks. Look, if I, if I could start with you as a UK national, I, some British people I've spoken to, reasonable people, feel that they're being treated unfairly. The, the Juncker, the leak of the, the Downing Street uh, dinner with you between Juncker and May, the money issue, the sequencing issue, that the British had a vote, they voted to leave and they're not being treated fairly. Do you think there's, there's uh, any, how, how do you view that position as a, as a UK national? Okay. Um, if you're coming from the context of a very naive debate about Europe, which has characterised British discussions of, of membership over the last 43 years, I can see why you would see that the EU is presented as being um, unfair towards the, the UK, is not taking the EU, UK's position um, in, into consideration. But if one understands the EU, it comes back to the point made earlier, does the, EU, does the UK understand the EU? The, the position which Juncker, the others have adopted, should not come as any surprise whatsoever at all. Um, and I think this is actually one of the big problems we have in the British debate, um, and this will be interesting what I said to the media later, is that is it actually capable of reporting on a process which is going to have to involve compromise and concession in a context when there's a lack of understanding of how the EU actually works? I say it's one of the biggest failings of the British whole, whole debate, which is now to the, to the referendum and, and the position we're in, is the British are still coming to terms with actually what 43 years of membership means. And if they don't actually understand that, it's very difficult for them to really appreciate the difficulties of actually unpicking that relationship. Hence the, 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 the negative reactions towards Juncker and Tusk and the others. Uh, Colin, you, you said you thought there was a big risk that the, the talks could break down. Just that issue, do you, do you think people in the unionist community, because the unionists apparently there's a much bigger uh, vote to leave amongst the unionist community, do you think there's an alienation towards the EU in the unionist community? An alienation towards the EU? Well, I mean, it's a whole different topic, uh, uh, Northern Unionism. Um, well, the way it could feed into it, the, yeah, the, the UK uh, government uh, like, position. So you have to come up from the point of view that Northern Unionism will, will, will still default to, be, to believing that any situation outside of its continued membership in the United Kingdom is disadvantageous to Northern Unionism. So that is what gets in the way of making Northern Ireland work as a region because it involves compromise around the regional status, de facto or implied, and that in itself causes enough of a crisis within unionism to cause it to default. So I think unionism has, has ended up here with regard to Brexit on default setting. What, what I think needs to happen, and this is why Declan's point about the importance of the restoration of devolution and devolved institutions, is to move the debate beyond that and to start creating the space where Northern Unionism has, the, has literally got enough of a comfort around it to be able to explore what the options might be. If that doesn't happen, so if there is no restoration of devolution in Northern Ireland, and if there isn't stable government in the United Kingdom, and if government is beholden to an orange card, then Northern Unionism will not be able to develop a sophisticated, uh, no, that's the wrong word, develop a mature attitude towards these talks. It will, by virtue, default 
into having a reactive attitude towards them. And that would just be adding to the first complications within the UK and for us on the island of Ireland. That's my view. Could, could I come to maybe Declan Catherine on, on, on just how this whole thing works? Barnier is negotiating on behalf of 26, 27 uh, countries. Um, he's negotiating with the British, and the 27 have to try and influence to keep an eye. Could you just explain how that, you know, how you can look over, how you look over his shoulder, how you influence the position, how, how that, you know, how that actually just functions on a day-to-day -day basis? <clears throat> well, I think it's worth just making the point that our core issues were special a special set of issues. I mean, there are three priorities for the first phase, um, citizens, the financial settlement, and Ireland. And um, the importance which Barney and his team attest to Ireland, the intensity of the contacts we have are quite unique. And Barnier has said that he wants a unique settlement, and he is very, very close to the thinking of the Irish government on this. He's been to Dublin, uh, he's met the previous Taoiseach several times, the current Taoiseach met him last Thursday, he meets ministers, he's in, I'm in regular contact with him and his staff. I just want to emphasize that point that this is not, uh, when you say EU27, it is not ourselves looking in on this as an outsider. This is something we're deeply and absolutely woven into. I would make that point. Obviously, citizens' rights and uh, the financial settlement were like the other members of the 27, but the Irish issue is an issue of such capital importance. Uh, we are deeply woven in, and that is fully understood and accepted uh, by Michel Barney and his task force. One other point I would make is that um, this, again, emphasises the importance of being a full and active member of the European Union, that we do and we have had extremely close relations with the institutions of the Commission. Catherine can talk more about that, with the Secretariat, with the European Parliament. And going back to something David said, it, the psychological shock, visible psychological shock, that uh, the British delegation had in Brussels, when they suddenly realised that, you know, they weren't part of the project anymore. I mean, they, they don't leave until they leave. But things have changed fundamentally. And when, when was now that? In EU27. Was there a particular moment? This would have been, uh, this would have been um, in the run-up to the European Council of the 29th of April. Mm. It was quite, it's quite noticeable. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, I just want to put that in context, but you asked Catherine too, so that... Yeah. Well, yeah, so Catherine, you know, from your experience of the way the Commission operates negotiating with Canada or other, other countries, to what extent is the Commission acting as a coordinator for the 27, and to what extent is it an actor sort of feeding back and, and um, you know, what, just explain that dynamic of the role of the Commission. Well, the Commission is negotiating for the Union, so it's not, uh, it's not the council negotiating uh, under the instruction from the 27 member states. Now, um, I always describe the commission negotiations as like having 27 mothers-in-law, because there is not a single second that the 27 are not crawling all over the commission, right. phoning in, seeing people. Declan talked about four times a day contact. You multiply that by 27 plus regions, plus senates, plus everything. So. Um, the Commission doesn't have a minute to itself. And the, the Commission has decided, I think, wisely and inevitably to go for full transparency. So it has a website, it will put up all the papers that it sends to the Member States and to the British, 24 hours after it sends them to the Member States. The Commission has very little, if no one more proper, so if the Member States say, what the hell are you doing, change that, the Commission will change it. So it has to look after what's defined in the treaties as the European interest. But of course, who, who is the European Union except its member states? Um, and the relationship is very closely interwoven. Um, Cora Bear, um, Declan's committee, is, is a key player, but there's also a working party. There's the General Affairs Council. There's the, every meeting of the European Council will devote what some member states will consider as too much time to the Brexit issues from now until it's over. Um, like who's so on the working party? Member State representatives. Okay. And the Commission will report uh, regularly in the beginning to the Council, to the Member States and to the Parliament, but I think it will end up being daily at certain points, or half daily even. And it becomes a logistical problem for the Commission, 
be, and that's why it's decided on full transparency, because it's almost impossible to keep everybody simultaneously informed. And there's a lot of suspicion. So everybody thinks somebody else has the inside track. So the Commission is driven demented on the one hand, trying to deal with the negotiations, and on the other hand, trying to assure everybody that it is telling everybody everything, and that there are some things that nobody will know until they happen. So the mechanics are complicated, but I mean, this, this is standard Brussels business. Um, it's why you have a permanent committee of, of, of ambassadors in Brussels. Um, and they have a difficult job of always reporting back home uh, to people who are following it less than full time uh, and still wanting to get the nuances and all the rest of it. So the act of gathering the political intelligence from the capitals is uh, in, uh, important for the commission through the core pair as well as through its own. That's, um, that's the, the, the ambassadors. Yeah. The core um, d David, I'm going to. Anybody have questions? If you do want to indicate uh, an interest in, in putting a question to any any one of the panelists, I'll, I'll, I'll take up a, a, a number a list. But David, that that mentioned that suspicion thing, the issue of suspicion. Do you you know? He has a long history of the member states having disagreements about different things. It's been quite surprising, I think, for the 27 so far don't seem to have been arguing amongst themselves about the about the so the, the exit so far. Do you see that being maintained, or do you see the risk of the different countries within the 27 having open disagreements about how to deal with Britain? You, okay, I think you're definitely going to have disagreements, um, and, and they will come to the fore. I think one of the problems you've got is in the absence of a clear British position. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to really begin to be critical uh, in terms of substance and for divisions to emerge. I think if, if the UK had been far clearer on what it actually wanted from the exit and what it wants from the future relationship, then you actually create more, more things on the agenda around which to, to disagree. At the moment, very, very little indeed. And so that I think allows the EU27 to sort of maintain the unity. Um, a lot's going to depend on what, what the UK is going to be pushing for. You want to come in, I do, yes, because I think um, my, my view is the unity will remain very strong on the big things. So the principles that David was outlining, for example. I think we will see less unity when we get into the negotiation of the trade details of the future relationship, because every member state competes with every other member state. And I think there will be, and there have been, um, already UK attempts to divide the union, and there will maybe be other attempts to divide the union. Uh, for different reasons. But I think it's both a question of understanding that the EU has to stay united and, again, a recognition of, of inevitability that the, the, any deal has to be uh, agreed by qualified majority by the member states and, and they will try to do it by consensus if at all possible. So in the end, even if you are tempted to cut and run and do a deal, a, a side deal, it will have to come back to the main table and, um, so I, and everybody watches everybody else. So I think um, this, that steadying effect of being condemned, if you like, to staying together will keep the unity mm -hmm. on the EU side. Thank you. Are you being watched particularly closely, Declan? Because obviously we, we are, Ireland has a closer interest in all of this. So are, are, are other countries looking at you a little suspiciously, thinking maybe <laughs> <laughs> you're a bit too close to Britain? You can be Britain's, Britain's work. I, I think that Look, we, we have um, a kind of a geographical uh, situation. Um, Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom is on the island of Ireland. This was one of the reasons why the, the, um, the approach by ministers and officials going to capitals and a kind of an educational mission several months ago was so important just to explain what the co-guarantor status was of the Good Friday Agreement to explain uh, how the North-South Ministerial Council worked, to explain how the British-Irish Council worked, all of that, and to distinguish that from the question of negotiating if, uh, before notification or negotiating on our own. That point, I think, is fully understood now, and certainly is understood to a much greater degree than it was, say, a year ago. So I, I think, uh, to answer your point, uh, no, I mean, of course, I'm paranoid, but, uh, but I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily, it, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not all after you anyway, but anyway. Um, but no, no, I think, I think we've gone past that, and I think we've explained our particular set of circumstances very clearly. And by the way, one of the positive effects of that, Dan, has been that there is now also a much greater grasp on the part of our uh, partners 
about the unique set of challenges, the absolutely unique predicament we have on this. So that's been a positive outcome of this pedagogical exercise, if you like. Okay, okay. Good. Alison, you wanted to, to come yeah, in. There's, a, there's a, a mic there. Listening, listening to the panel collectively, um, there's obviously a high level of respect for the British Civil Service. Uh, but I can only, my own conclusion listening is to what has been said about uh, Conservative Party politicians and their approach so far would be to use the word damning, you know, their ill preparedness, unwillingness, apparent unwillingness to accept reality. And even as they now are in negotiations, st still in that place. So is it wrong of me to sit here and feel utterly despairing <laughs> as to how? how the negotiations are, are, are going to go or how there could be any level of a, a successful conclusion if, if that remains. Even I think it was Catherine who said that, that the, the Conservative Party politicians didn't even know their way around the EU. And I, and I, I don't know whether she'd say they, they do now or not. Do you want to start with? Um, <coughs> on the Conservative Party, well, I, I, would, I would make two points on that. One is that you are, now I'm not an historian, but I think it's pretty clear that what we're seeing with Brexit is the third great split in the Conservative Party going past the last nearly 200 years. The early 19th century, it was essentially over the Corn Laws. It was essentially, would the new mercantile Conservatives uh, outweigh the old landowning Conservatives? And the early 20th century is about something which had some echoes in the May government through our advisor, the notion of imperial trade preference, which again has echoes even now, is on some of the things you hear about going back to be a free trader and having deals with India and whoever. Uh, but I think the interesting thing, though, is that, and it's a point that I think was, was raised earlier, about the lack of a big idea, the lack of big thinking in the current British debate. When you consider one of the most uh, profound moves forward in the EU during our time as membership, and something of huge benefit to us, it was the creation of the single market in 1992. And the British were, in a sense, and Mrs Thatcher, uh, played a very important role in that. And this was something which was a huge benefit for Ireland. It was a big benefit for the UK. It was a great move forward for the European Union. But if you say that now in a debate, that's, that's just not taken account of. It's seen as, you know, elitist special pleading. I mean, there is a problem of uh, big thinking. There's also another issue I've noticed to myself. Traditionally, the British argument uh, for keeping a seat at the table in the European Union was you have to have a seat at the top table. We're a permanent member of the Security Council, we're a nuclear power, we punch above our weight. That kind of argument doesn't seem to cut it anymore in the British uh, debate. Certainly it isn't as uh, persuasive as it was. So are we deluding ourselves, is what I'm wondering. <coughs> if that's the, the attitude that has been and that appears to remain, to think that there can be anything other than a goodbye, we're out of here in maybe two, three years. I think all of I think Europe generally needs to needs to think a lot more about what's happened in the United Kingdom uh, in in the past 25 30 years needs to understand them that's our great lesson from the peace process is that we had to understand where unionism had come from where it was and where it was heading to and we needed to remain able to understand it as we did Irish republicanism in its in its physical force form and we are now able to and think about how we have changed all of us for our ability to do so. so. So three things about the UK. One is, this was the perfect storm of post-war Britain coming back to haunt itself. You know, there was all the stuff that Declan's just referred to, the fact that Thatcher actually was one of the great globalisers. The city of London today is the most amazing place. Uh, you know, and you don't have to be a die-hard capitalist to appreciate that. It is the most global, small part of the world, of the world. And I can say that from direct experience of having teams in all the big global cities. It's incredible. That's because of Thatcher. Um, uh, the London as a whole, as a metropolis, is probably the greatest global city in the world. And that is a consequence of the mid-80s, early 90s, and Britain taking a very progressive, very, very uh, uh, open attitude towards, uh, towards the world. And its vehicle was the European, European communities that were then, and now the European Union. And against that, 
uh, you had post-war deindustrialization, de de you had uh, the growing cost of the welfare state, and you had all those chickens coming home to roost, and they have now conflated in this moment. And Connell, can I just tell you, you yeah. mentioned there were three things, technocratic ability, a contrarian spirit, and a vision. And the big picture. Do, do you see in either of the two vision There's parties, very quickly run out of time, but just, do you see any sign of vision no. of the two big parties what, in the UK? What we have at the moment in the United Kingdom is politics that is reacting to one thing or the other. Right. Conservatives are reacting to one thing, Labour's reacting to another. Catherine, you want to come in? Um, yes, I don't think we need to fall into despair. Um, my experience of the British is they're very pragmatic. Uh, I just think it's taking them a long time to get to the point where their normal pragmatism comes into play. And uh, my working assumption is they will leave. I would love to see it different and perhaps, you know, time will tell. But I think we have to work on the assumption they're going to leave. They will not want to just crash out of, of the European Union and we won't want that to happen either. Um, which is why I think the time factor and adjusting the time factor may be the way to get to the point where where their pragmatism come into play and there, and we can reach uh, a deal. It's interesting to me that the EU has very often solved its problems by time, giving people more time, taking more time. That's why it's criticised for being slow and cumbersome, but sometimes it's worth taking extra time to get to an agreed outcome. For, firstly, um, is it possible to have, to have Northern Ireland retain a link to the customs union if Britain withdraws, given the complexities of all of that? And secondly, would Europe be on, on board with that? Would you, would you accept a sort of a solution that would see a tweaking of the rules slightly? Thank you. Take long. Uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. In, the, in his speech to, at Leinster House, Michel Barnier said, I can't do the accent, uh, <laughs> I will work with you to avoid a hard border. And he also said, um, we have a duty to speak the truth. Customs controls are part of EU border management. They protect the single market. They protect our food safety and our standards. I, I'm a bit confused now about customs control. It sounds like a hard border. Um, I, is, that all, is that a totally bad thing? I mean, I, I imagine that the Irish farmers in the, in the Republic wouldn't want a very cheap Argentinian beef being slipped across the border. Uh, without any checks. So, uh, on the other hand, uh, they would probably like uh, free access to the UK market. So, can somebody clarify this for me? Because the more I, I hear about Brexit, the more confused I get. Um, Paul. Um, I'd like to maybe to, to Declan, you referred to the, um, the, 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 the three aspects in Ireland being at a, a, a fundamental issue and at a higher level. And is this dialogue being set up, as I understand it, uh, um, uh, between the main British and, and the Commission uh, Deputy of Guardian? How do you see this working out at a higher level? It, it pres that process will continue right through the negotiations, as I understand it. Do you think imaginative and flexible <laughs> solutions can be brought by the British and Irish governments to that process? Uh, is it, I mean, having done the experiment, exploratory and explanatory work and having established that you're not trying to do side deals, uh, how do you see that, that mechanism uh, being used, uh, that dialogue? First question from Colm, I think you asked it to both Catherine and myself. The, I mean, you mentioned, Catherine, at the start that um, um, if the British basically reversed their position in the customs union, it would solve many, many problems. And also, let's be frank, the one thing the British would lose by staying in the customs union is the ability to cut uh, trade deals around the world. But I cannot think of any trade deal around the world that's going to take place within the next 10 years. Uh, I, and, uh, I mean, I know, for example, that uh, the British have already run into trouble with the Indians, the Chinese, I don't know fairly well, their prime interest in the UK was the assets the UK could deliver as a member of the European Union. Um, this will be lost. So I think this notion of some kind of bonanza, of a kind of an East India company revived, is simply not going to happen. Um, and in objective terms, one could make, I think, and I presume 
there would be officials in Whitehall thinking this through, looking at a cost-benefit analysis. The costs of staying in the uh, customs union are considerably less uh, than the benefits. Uh, so uh, that, that's one point I'd make. That also goes, I think, to your question and Jaglon's question too about um, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, we don't want a hard border. The customs union issue would address that, certainly for goods, including on phytosanitary and agricultural issues. We could kind of put in an add-on of services. There's a kind of elegant way forward on that. And even in terms of what uh, the British have been saying, depending on who you listen to, you get a different kind of volume in terms of this customs union point. Um, on Paul's question about um, the uh, handling of the Irish issues uh, in the first phase, again, I think the point there is you know, not to go into a freewheeling working group. Again, the important point about our issues is which end of the telescope you look through. The political, the high level, the strategic has to drive the technical, not the other way around. I think that's, that's the fundamental and important point. And again, Paul, that goes back to the wording of the guidelines of the directives of coming up with flexible and imaginative solutions. So I think, you know, as ba Michel Barnier has said himself, it's a unique situation. It will be a specifically tailored set of solutions. And I think the approach that's being taken is, uh, should be seen in the perspective of that objective uh, throughout. Uh, the other point here, finally, and I apologise for hugging the, the, the floor, is, it's been mentioned already by other members of the panel that um, at the moment there's no clear indication of uh, what the coordinated British position is. Thanks. Just on the customs union, I don't see how a part of a non-member state could be part of the customs union. Um, I don't, politically, that would also be difficult for London, I think. So that as, a, as a, an option, I don't see it existing. Um, but I, my hope would be along the lines that Declan has outlined that as we get into the negotiation of the details, that where the border, where the checks happen, is something that can be discussed. And uh, I think without, I mean, I'm not an expert in customs myself, so I won't speculate. But I think how and where you do the checks is eminently open to the flexible and creative solutions. But just to explain why you couldn't have a partial customs union, um, let's say the British leave the customs union and in 15 years' time they do this, uh, I think, less attractive trade deal with any other part of the world. Which rules would then apply in Northern Ireland? The EU rules or the British rules? It, it, it just doesn't work. Um, and I, I, I do myself find it hard to imagine how the UK, even as a developed economy, but a, a small economy in the modern world, could cut better trade deals um, with uh, international partners than the EU with its sizable market uh, has already achieved. Not to mention how long it takes and the capacity, negotiating capacity that you need. So I would hope that as um, the political and the ideological level becomes more familiar with what is the reality on the ground, um, that then perhaps staying in the customs union would become an option. And in her first speech um, where Theresa May said out of the single market, she didn't say in exactly the same firm terms out of the customs union. So there is a bit of wiggle room there that could hopefully be expanded in the future. Good, okay, I know there are more questions, but we're really out of time and a bunch of editors are under extreme time pressures here, so we'll keep it on, uh, on schedule and just ask the other two panelists if they have any responses to those questions or just final wrap up. Yeah, um, yes, I, I think the issue of the border, I think yeah, there's flexibility of where the border is going to be. That border is still going to be hard. It's just that the harshness of it will be dissipated across a number of different, different um, locations. There's going to be controls. They're going to be exercised in, in, in different different locations. Um, I think the customs union could could a non part of a non-member state be part of the customs union. Brokenshire said associate membership of the customs union is something they want to explore. Um, I think we've got to put something like that on the table. I think in terms of um, flexible and imaginative solutions, I think we're at a, a, an unprecedented stage here. Um, the, I don't think the EU has ever adopted such language in, in a set of mandates for negotiations with the third, yeah. the third country. Um, the scope is there, we're unprecedented at times. I think all various ideas have got to be put on, onto, onto the table and I think there will be considerable flexibility shown towards here and the north, but not to London. So I think on one hand it could be a very harsh set of negotiations with, 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 with London 
um, but there's flexibility um, for some sort of arrangement being put in, in here. I think, just going back to an earlier point, I think that the capacity within London to really understand the issues is very, very high within the civil service. Mm -hmm. I think there's been some excellent work ongoing. The big problem is that all the various solutions they tend to come up with run up against the political acceptability of them, um, particularly <laughs> amongst a, a set of politicians who have become wedded to uh, sort of a, a concept, conceptualization of the future, which I think bears very little um, bearing on reality. And have those politicians in the UK softened their stance over the past years? They've learnt more about the process? They couldn't have not learnt more. I think given the low levels of understanding <laughs> on, that, on the part of many. <clears throat> and come. I guess, I guess to, to, to sum up where I started, like everything is possible in the European Union. That's why it is the European Union. So what are the conditions that we need to achieve for everything to be possible and for us to have the solution on this island that we need? Well, we need cohesion within the United Kingdom. Simples. There needs to be a consensus at Westminster level as to what the negotiating priorities are and our ability to make sure that Ireland and Northern Ireland survives this process without damage. There needs to be co co consensus at a regional level in Great Britain that there will be a different arrangement for Northern Ireland than for Scotland and Wales and that that doesn't cause a political crisis. And of course for all that to be possible there needs leadership and that is the one thing that is absent. So I'll bring us back to where we started until you see clear and definite signs of leadership in the United Kingdom, this ain't going to go well at all for anyone. Declan, do you want to book in the whole thing? Just, just one thing, the context is changing too in the EU. Uh, Draghi was at the European Council on Friday and he said we've had 16 quarters of average growth. Now this is, um, this is interesting because you remember one of the great uh, uh, rallying cries of the Brexiteers, not only will we get out of the Union, but the whole miserable edifice would collapse. And that's not going to happen. And in fact, there are some quite profound changes going on in the background. As I say, uh, the EU 27 and Ireland in particular were on a growth path. Things are starting to hum. We're making good progress on completing the digital market, the digital single market. Issues that traditionally the British would have been totally at the forefront of. And I think that's an irony too as we look at this. Now, this is something again that's going to take time to filter through, but I just think it's something that should be kept in the background of our minds. Thank okay. You. Okay, thanks.